Good afternoon, colleagues. We begin this afternoon with First Minister's questions. And before we turn to the questions, could I invite the First Minister to update Parliament on the situation with COVID-19? Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. I'll give a very quick update on today's statistics. Uh, 1,121 new cases were reported yesterday. Uh, that's 5.2% of all of the tests carried out and takes the overall number of cases to 194,269. Uh, 1,317 people are currently in hospital with COVID. Uh, that's 66 fewer than yesterday, and 99 people are receiving intensive care, which is one fewer than yesterday. However, I'm sorry to report that 64 more deaths were registered of patients who first tested positive over the previous 28 days. And so the total number of people who have died under this daily measurement is now 6,828. However, National Records of Scotland has just published its weekly update, which includes cases where COVID is a suspected or contributory cause of death. And today's update shows that by Sunday, the total number of registered deaths linked to COVID under the wider definition was 9,053. 323 of these were registered last week. That is 54 fewer than over the previous week. And again, my condolences go to everyone who has lost someone. Uh, now, every death from COVID is deeply regrettable, and for that reason, it never feels quite right to talk about encouraging news in the context of the NRS report. However, there are aspects of today's report that really do bear some emphasis because they give us, I think, the first hard evidence of the positive impact of vaccination. Deaths overall have fallen now for three consecutive weeks. Uh, deaths that occurred in hospitals have fallen over that three-week period by 11% and deaths occurring in people's own homes or in other non-institutional settings have fallen by 29%. However, deaths in care homes, which were the early focus of the vaccination programme, have fallen by 62%. In fact, with the exception of one week at the end of August, when there were only two COVID deaths registered overall, care homes accounted for a smaller proportion of overall COVID deaths last week than at any time since March of last year. And I think that is positive uh, news given the toll that the virus has taken on our care homes. More generally, the age breakdown of the total number of deaths over the last three weeks shows that the largest reduction, a reduction of 45%, was in the over 85 age group. And of course, over 80s living in the community were the next priority focus of the programme. So I think it is reasonable to take some heart from this because it strongly suggests that the vaccine programme is having the hoped for effect of reducing the death toll from the virus. Uh, on the vaccination programme, uh, more generally, I can report that as of 8.30 this morning, uh, 1,320,074 people had received the first dose, which is an increase of 32,070 since yesterday. Uh, as I indicated yesterday, we've offered first doses to all over 70s, all care home residents, all frontline health and care workers, and all people with a serious clinical vulnerability. And 64% of 65 to 69 year olds have also now received the first dose. And again, I want to thank everyone involved in delivering the programme. Uh, there's just one final point I want to quickly highlight today, which is that from tomorrow, the advice given to close contacts of people uh, who test positive for COVID will change, as well as being asked to isolate for 10 days. They will also now be asked as a matter of course to get tested as well and if they then test positive their contacts will be traced and more chains of transmission will be broken so this is a further strengthening of test and protect uh, now as i confirmed yesterday next week we will publish a revised strategic framework which will set out the, the data principles and priorities that will guide our gradual exit from lockdown when the time is right but for now if we want to maintain the good progress we are seeing and avoid setbacks uh, we must stick with it so if i can end by continuing uh, to urge people to stay at home except for essential purposes so that we can continue to protect the NHS and, of course, save lives. Thank you very much. I would urge all members who wish to ask a question now to press their request to speak buttons and I call on Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Over the last 10 months and even before that, governments across the world have made mistakes in their planning for and handling of this pandemic. But today's report by Audit Scotland identifies a lack of preparedness on the part of the Scottish Government stretching back to over a decade. Specifically, it charges that SNP ministers failed to implement key recommendations made after pandemic planning exercises in 2015, 2016 and 2018. 
Between Exercise Silver Swan, Exercise Cygnus and Exercise Iris, these reports made 52 specific recommendations. Can I ask the First Minister how many of those recommendations had been implemented by the Scottish Government by March of 2020? First Minister. The Audit Scotland report this morning is important, as all Audit Scotland reports are, and the Government, uh, as we always do, will pay very close attention to it. However, one of the key points, uh, one of uh, the, the paramount points that the report makes, and I'm going to quote from it here, is this one. The Scottish Government and the NHS responded quickly to the rapidly developing pandemic. Now, in terms of uh, the three uh, pandemic preparedness exercises, Silver Swan in 2015, Cygnus in 2016, and exercise iris in 2018. I don't have the uh, full list of 52 recommendations in front of me here, but I'm happy to uh, arrange for that information to be uh, provided. Uh, but as a result of these exercises, a range of national and local pandemic guidance and plans were updated uh, to take account of the lessons of these exercises. But one of the key points is, is this one, I think, and it's, it's perhaps one that's not captured fully in the Audit Scotland report, is that what we uh, found ourselves dealing with in February, March of this year was not a flu pandemic, um, and therefore no amount of preparedness for a flu pandemic would have been sufficient in the face of the situation that we actually encountered. Uh, however well prepared we'd been for flu, it became uh, clear quite quickly that we were dealing with something of a completely different nature. And in fact, it, if I reflect back on the last 10 months, and of course this will be something for proper scrutiny in the fullness of time, I actually think the more valid criticism of both the Scottish Government and indeed governments across the Western world is that we relied perhaps in the early stages of the pandemic too much on flu pre preparations and perhaps hadn't done enough to prepare for the experiences of SARS uh, type outbreaks. So that's one of the key lessons I think that governments across uh, certainly the Western world will have to learn uh, and of course we'll add that to the lessons that the Audit Scotland report has for us. But let me end this answer where I started. Uh, according to Audit Scotland, the government and the NHS responded quickly to the rapidly developing pandemic. Ruth Davison. It was no surprise, Presiding Officer, that the First Minister didn't want to give a number on those 52 recommendations that had been carried out, because the Audit Scotland report highlights a catalogue of missed opportunities on the part of the Scottish Government, including a failure to ensure the proper supply and use of personal protective equipment, or PPE. It makes clear that the PPE stockpile, and I quote, was not enough to fully meet the demands of the NHS. After the 2016 exercise, a working group identified access to PPE as a priority action to be completed by March of 2018. Then Exercise Iris, two years before the onset of the COVID pandemic, again warned the government that it needed to up its game on PPE. We simply shouldn't have had NHS staff forced to work without adequate protection, reusing masks and having to beg for donations because PPE wasn't in place. First Minister, why didn't the Scottish Government act on the repeated warnings it received in this report, in this report and in this report, when doing so would have meant that doctors, nurses and carers were properly protected? First Minister. You see, I, I simply don't accept the characterisation of Ruth Davidson there and I don't believe it bears any real scrutiny. Um, if you look at PPE in particular, uh, Scotland never once, uh, has never once throughout this entire pandemic ran out of PPE. Um, and in fact, uh, not just that, we were in a position at an earlier stage of the pandemic to offer mutual aid to other parts of the UK. What we found uh, was uh, Two things. Firstly, and if the Conservatives want to, these are really, really serious issues, um, and I think they do bear uh, proper response and consideration. What we uh, found, first of all, is that we had to improve, and we did improve rapidly, uh, the distribution mechanisms for PPE to make sure that that got to the front line quickly. We did that with the NHS. Uh, we set up a, a, a portal so that anybody who had concerns could quickly raise those concerns and have them addressed. And of course, in addition to the NHS, we, we very quickly put new arrangements in place to top up the PPE supplies that were available to our care homes across the country. There was also uh, some very detailed consideration that was required by experts, not by politicians, of the, the particular PPE needs given, to go back to my earlier point, which 
can't just be glossed over um, in all of this that we weren't dealing with a flu pandemic. We were dealing with a completely different beast, uh, something that had uh, the need uh, or required in some respects uh, a different response. Uh, so we took all of those steps. We continue to ensure that we have good supplies, robust supplies of the right PPE. And into the bargain, of course, uh, we've also developed a domestic supply chain for PPE, not by giving contracts uh, to our uh, political chums the way some other governments have uh, done, but actually uh, by uh, building that domestic supply chain. So before this pandemic, there was effectively zero Scottish PPE manufacturing. We were fully, wholly reliant on imports. Uh, but over this winter period, nearly half of all PPE that's been used in Scotland is being supplied from Scotland. So there are, and I will be uh, the, the last to ever uh, try to deny this, there are lots of lessons for us to learn and we have to do that properly as we go, but also when we come out of this pandemic. Uh, but actually, I think the steps that we, we have taken are the right ones um, and uh, we will continue to make sure that the NHS and wider society is properly equipped. Ruth Davison. First Minister stands there and tells us that there was no issue with PPE last year. Well, perhaps she wants to tell that to Scotland's nurses, half of whom told the RCN that they were forced, forced to reuse single-use protection. But, presiding officer, tragically, Scotland's care homes have seen over a third of Scotland's COVID deaths, with more than 3,000 people losing their lives there since March last year. The advice handed to the First Minister in three separate reports was that more had to be done to protect social care and that should have been consulted on as far back as 2018. Instead that consultation didn't open until over a year later. It closed in September 2019, six months before Scotland's first Covid wave. But in that six months the guidance was never updated and no updates were ever published. Crucially that means care homes were left to face the pandemic with guidance almost a decade old and hopelessly out of date. We know that the Scottish Government is now reviewing this guidance, but it's far too late for too many grieving families. Isn't it just a fact that had the First Minister and her Government acted on this sooner and brought forward that guidance, demanded before Covid struck that some lives in those care homes could have been saved? First Minister. Uh, again, no, um, I, I don't accept that. Just firstly, can I round off on the, the previous question? Because I didn't say there were no issues with PPE. What I took the time to do was set out properly what those issues were. They weren't the issues that Ruth Davidson had said. Uh, the issues were around distribution and making sure we had the right types and then building that domestic supply chain. So I know that doesn't suit the, the sound bites that Ruth Davidson wants to hurl across the chamber. But I actually spend... I spend each and every day dealing with the fine detail of these issues and that's what I try to share uh, with the public. On the issue of care homes, it, it's simply not true to say that there wasn't guidance issued to care homes. There was guidance issued to care homes right at the start of the pandemic. Uh, we have uh, taken steps to amend that guidance as our knowledge and understanding of exactly what it is we were dealing with developed uh, and we will continue to do that. Again, I. Uh, have been and will continue to be very candid. I think if we could turn the clock back and if we could have then the knowledge that we have now about the, the nature of the pandemic we were dealing with, we would have done certain things differently in care homes. And I desperately wish we could have that time again. But we have made sure, uh, both in terms of guidance, the focus on infection prevention and control in care homes, uh, the use of testing when our knowledge uh, developed uh, to allow that to change. And of course, more recently, uh, the focus we have had criticised or certainly by implication criticised just a couple of weeks ago uh, by Ruth Davidson in her questions about vaccination. But because we have uh, focused over uh, recent uh, weeks on making sure not just that we offered the vaccine to every older person in a care home, but we actually got the vaccine to every older person in a care home, we are now seeing that rapid reduction in deaths in care homes, which I'm not sure, although uh, we have to wait and see the figures, will be exactly mirrored in all other parts of the UK. So there are lessons to learn every day uh, in this, and I take that very, very seriously. Uh, but I don't think Ruth Davidson... Uh, does any favours to anybody involved in this just to mischaracterise some of the really difficult challenges that we have been and continue to deal with. Ruth Jameson. 
Let me read directly from the report so there's no mischaracterisation. The First Minister talks about the guidance issued to care homes. Let me read it. Page 21. Flu pandemic guidance published in 2012, designed for health and social care in England, was issued to health and social care in Scotland, despite the fact that her government had been told they had to update that guidance in 2018. It wasn't open to consultation until 2019. And even when the consultation had shut six months before COVID hit, they still hadn't published it. Two years of failure in telling social care accommodation and care homes what they should be doing and how they should be doing it. Now, throughout this pandemic, the First Minister has sought to build a reputation on how she's handled this virus. But the truth is, her government was less prepared than it should have been. And it is set out in black and white in today's Audit Scotland report. Mistakes were made by this government. Mistakes that cost the health of frontline workers. Mistakes that cost the lives of care home residents. Mistakes that built up over a decade of delay. This report from the Auditor General makes it plain that her government was warned again and again and again. There were years where this First Minister could have acted. What stopped her? Minister. You know, I, I just don't think it bears any real or serious scrutiny. I, I've sought to do nothing over the past uh, 10 months, almost a year now, other than every single day do my best and make sure the government was doing its best to steer this country uh, as safely through this pandemic as we possibly can. And that is still my focus each and every single day, no matter uh, the attempts Ruth Davidson might want to make uh, to change uh, that. Uh, so that's what I will do. I've admitted mistakes all along. I will continue to make sure the government is seeking to learn from mistakes as we go. Um, and I, for uh, as long as I live, will regret uh, the toll that this virus has taken, particularly on the older members of our community and those living in care homes. But I also know that because of some of the decisions we've taken, and much, much more than that, because of the efforts of health and social care workers across the country, uh, we can here stand here in Scotland and say that we have a, a lower number of cases than other parts uh, of the UK. We have uh, a lower uh, number of deaths proportionately far too high and don't anybody uh, misunderstand the point I'm making far too high but lower uh, certainly than England than uh, in Wales and we continue to try to take the steps every single day to make sure we are reducing the impact uh, of this virus so that's all I seek to do uh, every day right now and it's all I will continue to seek to do. Um, and I'll go back to Ruth Davison wants to uh, quote uh, the Audit Scotland report, so um, I will uh, do that too. Staff across the NHS and Scottish Government have worked hard in challenging circumstances. The Scottish Government and NHS responded quickly. Uh, the actions that were taken prevented the NHS from becoming overwhelmed. Uh, what they describe as the initial difficulties in supplying and distributing, which I talked about PPE, were resolved. Supply now meets uh, demand. Uh, and I could go on. The Scottish Government worked to improve the support available for the health and social care workforce during the pandemic. Uh, and of course, it goes on into the steps we're now taking to rebuild and remobilise the health service. So, you know, I will uh, continue to try to make sure the government learns lessons, but each and every single day, for as long as it takes, I will stay focused on leading this country as safely as possible through these circumstances. Question number two, Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, let me start by sending condolences to all those who have lost loved ones to COVID. Um, the issues highlighted by the Audit Scotland report are so important, I make no apology for covering this again. The First Minister says that this pandemic is unprecedented, and she's right. But today's report from Audit Scotland makes clear a pandemic should have been anticipated. The government knew it could threaten the lives of people across Scotland. They were told the social care system would struggle to cope. And they were warned that access to protective equipment for our nurses and doctors just simply wasn't good enough. But now we learn that they didn't act on any of these warnings. In 2015, 2016, 2018, the government received clear recommendations that they simply failed to act on. Exercise Silver Swan, Exercise Cygnus, Exercise Iris, all identified problems, but the government was just too slow to act. As a result, the areas that were neglected, according to Audit Scotland, and I quote, became areas of significant challenge during the COVID-19 pandemic. The First Minister referenced flu planning, 
but the flu pandemic planning the government did carry out repeatedly highlighted vulnerabilities in PPE supplies and in social care, the very areas of challenge in this pandemic. If the Scottish Government had acted in advance, we would have been in a better position to respond whatever the virus was. First Minister, you had warning after warning after warning. So was your failure to act negligence or incompetence? First Minister. Well, I'm not even going to respond to that uh, because it is, it is actually quite demeaning to people, not me, but to people across government, across the country, who've worked every single day to try to deal with this crisis. Um, I've already uh, alluded to Silver Swan, Cygnus and Iris. All of these lessons were properly embedded into the national and local uh, pandemic guidance. Uh, but I come back to the point, and actually, um, I, what, in doing this, I'm actually acknowledging what I think is a real criticism of this government and many other governments as well. And it's one, while I think the Audit Scotland report is really important, I actually think it is a point that is missed from the Audit Scotland report. This was not a flu pandemic. Uh, uh, Jackie Bailey says that we should have anticipated a pandemic almost on the first day, certainly the first week that I was in government as a health secretary, I was briefed on the potential for a pandemic. It was a flu pandemic and we did lots of prepare. We had a flu pandemic in 2009 and we learned lessons from that as well. I think one of the significant issues we have to reflect on is the fact that not enough of our planning and preparedness was for the actual nature of the pandemic that we've been dealing with. Uh, COVID and, and SARS-type viruses are very, very different to flu. So these are lessons that we have been learning and will continue to learn. I simply don't think it is true or borne out by the facts that we weren't prepared on PPE, although we did have, as I have acknowledged, not just today but previously, we had issues in terms of the distribution of PPE early on, which we took early action to resolve. And in terms of care homes, guidance was in place for care homes that we have adapted um, and evolved as our understanding of this virus has adapted and evolved. So in the fullness of time, uh, there will be real proper detailed scrutiny. I believe we might still be the first government in the UK that has committed to a full public inquiry. But for now, I and my ministers will continue to get on with the job of making sure we're taking the country through this, getting more people vaccinated, suppressing this virus so that we get back to normal as quickly as we can. Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I make no criticism of the staff who I think have been absolutely hardworking and brilliant throughout this, but the, cab the First Minister needs to stop hiding behind them because this is a matter of leadership and that is something she is responsible for. Can I repeat to her, can I repeat to her, flu pandemic planning that the government did carry out repeatedly highlighted vulnerabilities in PPE supplies and in social care. Had you paid attention to that, as you say you did, we would not be in this position. Presiding officer, nowhere has the impact of the pandemic been more distressing than in our care homes. One in every three people to have lost their lives from COVID-19 have been in care homes. That's over 3,000 families bereaved by an epidemic that raced through our care homes, the very places we expect our elderly and our vulnerable to be safe. But concerns about the ability of social care to cope during a pandemic were highlighted five years ago by Exercise Cygnus. Equally, Exercise Silver Swan re recommended that the government, and I quote, ensure a wide range understanding of plans for distribution of PPE and prioritisation of key staff. That recommendation was made in April 2016. It was the end of March 2020, nearly four years later, and when the country was already gripped by the pandemic before the Scottish Government had a PPE distribution model for social care. We know the PPE was not adequate. There was initially a shortage of supply because health and social care staff told us so. I see the First Minister shakes her head, but these are the very staff that we praise for their efforts, and they were telling us what was going wrong. Had the First Minister listened to the warnings about the threat facing social care in a pandemic, and yes, in the context of flu pandemic planning too, lives could have been saved. Why didn't she? First Minister. Firstly, I have on not one single day since this pandemic struck hidden or tried to hide in any 
uh, way. In fact, on the days, uh, many of the days, uh, I think, when I've been seeking to the best of my ability to lead this country through the pandemic, Jackie Bailey has been writing letters to the BBC trying to stop me briefing the public uh, on a daily basis. So perhaps it is the, uh, the fact that this government has shown leadership that Jackie Bailey finds uh, quite so, so difficult to take. But it is because we did learn lessons from uh, the swine flu pandemic we had in 2009 and the exercises that were done, that we had a stockpile of PPE at the start of this pandemic. And as I said earlier on, that's why we never once ran out of PPE. And the early issues we faced in terms of the distribution of PPE within the health service, we quickly resolved. There are to this day ongoing concerns that we listen to very carefully from staff about the precise nature of the PPE and whether it is adequate to protect them from the virus, particularly as we face new variants. And our clinical advisors listen to that and discuss that so that we can respond as necessary. In addition to that, as I've already said, we took additional steps uh, to top up the PPE supplies that care home providers already had. So we have taken all of these steps. Has everything gone as we would have wanted? No, we have made mistakes. Uh, we've done things that had we had the knowledge we have now then, we would have done differently. Um, and we learn from those as we go. But every single day, this government, uh, with the dedication of people, not just in our health and social care workforce, but in many different sectors of our society, have tried to get through this as well as we possibly can, and we will continue to do that every single day. And, you know, Jackie Bailey talks about care homes. It's because we learned the lessons uh, from uh, care homes earlier this year that we made the decision that we were going to focus on getting uh, the maximum number of people in care homes vaccinated, not just offered the vaccine, but vaccinated, even if that slowed down the rest of the programme early on in it. And that was certainly by implication being criticised by Jackie Bailey and Ruth Davison just a couple of weeks ago. And I think that says it all. They'll criticise whatever we do, but we'll continue to get on with the job of keeping the people of this country as safe as we can. Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, what I'm very clear about is that there was no leadership in preparing for this pandemic. The First Minister referenced stockpiles of PPE. We know from staff on the ground that they were inadequate and they were also well out of date. And the whole point of this is not to learn after the event, but actually to learn beforehand. So we put in measures to prevent the scale of death that we witnessed. Presiding officer, the evidence is that when presented with recommendations, the government simply did not listen. They were too slow to prepare and too slow to act. We may have reacted quickly, and I welcome that. And I thank NHS and care staff for doing that. But we were simply not prepared. So here is an opportunity to listen and to act. Don't just clap for health and social care workers. Listen and act when they ask you for enhanced PPE to protect them and those they care for from the new COVID variants. We know the rate of hospital contracted COVID is still far too high. Since the start of the pandemic, at least 3,115 people have contracted COVID-19 in hospital. In the week ending 24th January, the Scottish Government rejected calls from Scottish Labour for enhanced PPE to protect staff and patients from the new variants, dismissing the concerns of the very staff whose attitude and whose evidence we all value so highly. That same week, at least 228 people contracted COVID-19 on hospital wards. So will the First Minister listen? Will she act? And will she give health and care staff the enhanced protection they need and they deserve? First Minister. Uh, we didn't dismiss those calls. I I'm not qualified um, as a politician, former lawyer, to decide the technical specifications of PPE. Uh, that's what I have clinical advisors for. And every time health or social care staff uh, say that they think they need a higher specification, we ask our clinical advisors to consider that um, and to come to a view. That has been done up until now on a, a Four Nations basis. So we will never dismiss those claims. The advice to me and to the government is 
is that the specification of PPE that is being used is appropriate for even the new variant uh, of COVID. If that advice changes, so too will the decisions we take on PPE. I would never, uh, not just as First Minister, although that is the most important point here, but as the sister of somebody who works in the front line of the NHS, as the sister-in-law of somebody, I would never dismiss uh, the views of those in the front line of the National Health Service. Uh, so we will continue we will continue to take those decisions based on the best advice. And we will continue to learn lessons, just as we learned lessons uh, from the 2009 uh, pandemic, from the exercises. But we'll also learn the lessons uh, of the, the real lessons of this one, which is that we must learn as we go. Um, and we must not uh, assume that the pandemics we're going to face are the ones that we have faced in the past. I think the real criticism here uh, of governments like this one uh, is that we should have been better prepared for a SARS-type virus and relied less on flu preparedness. Now, I'm uh, able to say that, but let's engage properly on these things rather than just chuck sound bites across a parliamentary chamber. Question three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We've all seen the pictures of hundreds of people queuing in the snow for emergency food in Glasgow's George Square last week. It's an indictment on the failure to tackle poverty and hunger in Scotland. This level of desperation is happening in the city that both the First Minister and I represent. And the charities which feed people in Glasgow have warned that the funding isn't getting to where it's needed. Last year, 80 organisations got the resources they need to carry out this emergency relief. This year, it's expected to be less than half that number. Uh, just as one example, the Children's Wood, which runs a holiday club for children in Mary Hill, has not received funding. Does the First Minister think it's acceptable that getting food to hungry children is a postcode lottery in Glasgow? And will she commit to universal solutions such as extending free school meals to all primary pupils all year round. First Minister. Uh, I've already made that commitment. We have made clear if we returned uh, to, to government, uh, then that is exactly what we will do. Uh, free school meals to all primary pupils and uh, children in early years all year round. So I hope other parties across the, the chamber will join us in that. Uh, and then whoever uh, emerges victorious from the election in May, we know that that uh, policy will be implemented. In terms of the wider issue, um, there is much more that we all need to do to tackle poverty and uh, like Patrick Harvey I was uh, appalled and disturbed at the photograph that circulated uh, a few days ago. I asked my officials to uh, look into the circumstances of that to engage uh, with relevant partners to see what more we can do. We have increased funding throughout the pandemic uh, for food uh, insecurity. We have increased funding to specifically help uh, those who are uh, having poverty exacerbated because of the pandemic. Indeed the Finance Secretary announced uh, even more funding for that just yesterday. So we will continue uh, to take whatever steps we can to help those who uh, are finding it toughest uh, as a result of, of what everybody is dealing with right now. But we're also, of course, taking the crucial steps to try to deal with the, the underlying causes of poverty. Uh, perhaps the most significant thing uh, that has happened in that regard this week is the launch of the new Scottish Child Payment, the only part of the UK with this scheme which is about lifting children and, uh, by extension, families out of poverty. So we will continue to do uh, what we can to try to consign poverty uh, to history in our country. Patrick Harvey. The First Minister doesn't need to wait until May to commit to the policy of extending eligibility for free school meals. It could be built into the budget that Parliament will be voting on later this month. And as we build a recovery from the pandemic, the First Minister has made it clear that returning schools to normal will rightly be the first priority. But to do that, we need to talk first about how we keep teachers and support staff safe. And vaccination must have a role to play here. I want to make it clear that we're not asking the government to ignore the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. They've recommended the first priority groups, but their own paper at the end of December said that occupational groups can be considered for priority in the next phase of the vaccine programme. Yesterday, the First Minister told my colleague Alison Johnson that some teachers will have been vaccinated already, but with schools reopening to more pupils from Monday, surely we must ask whether it is safe for those teachers who haven't been vaccinated 
be sent back into full classrooms without this protection? Doesn't it stand to reason that if reopening schools is a high priority, then vaccinating the staff who allow those schools to function must also be a priority too? First Minister. Well, firstly, you know, I want to make this point very clearly. Uh, we wouldn't be uh, going ahead with the decision we confirmed yesterday in terms of the phased reopening of schools if we weren't assured that that was safe. We are not complacent about that and we don't take these decisions lightly. Uh, there are mitigations uh, that will be in place in schools in terms of the senior phase. There will be very limited numbers of pupils uh, there. Uh, and we know that transmission, uh, the, the risk of transmission is much lower uh, when we're talking about the, the younger age groups. We also know from the evidence that uh, the, the risk in terms of reopening schools comes less from transmission within schools uh, than it does from the behaviour of adults around the reopening of schools, uh, taking it as a trigger for a return to normality, which is why I was at such pain yesterday to ask parents across the country not to do that uh, as of Monday. Uh, we're also introducing uh, testing, uh, twice weekly testing for teachers and school staff, and, and that gets underway straight uh, away as schools return from Monday. On the issue of vaccination, and, and these are points I, I do think it's important to take seriously, um, and I know that Patrick Harvey is not suggesting we don't follow the JCVI. We are still in the process of vaccinating the JCVI priority list. Uh, we hope we can complete that you know, as soon as possible, even sooner perhaps than our original target date. Uh, but that's the focus right now. We are waiting to see whether the JCVI gives us any more detailed advice for the order of priority uh, for the rest of the population. It is uh, absolutely the case that there may be uh, a focus on occupational groups, in which case that is what we would follow. Uh, but there are still unknowns about this vaccine uh, in terms of its impact on transmission as opposed to uh, mortality uh, and illness. And that is why at the moment it is really important that we follow the clinical priorities that the JCVI are setting. Uh, but we will continue to consider this with the other nations of the UK and as soon as we can set out what the approach will be once we have vaccinated those initial JCVI groups, what the approach will be uh, and if there is an order of priority to be followed for the rest of the population. Question four, Willie Rennie. How can the people of Scotland judge the First Minister on a record on education if she won't publish the OECD report until after the election. First Minister. The timetable of the OECD review that is underway right now has been set by the OECD. They are carrying this out uh, independently uh, for the Scottish Government um, and it would be wrong for us to seek uh, to dictate to them how they do that or on what time scale they do that. The work was delayed uh, because of the pandemic and uh, not least because of restrictions the OECD put on the ability of their staff to travel uh, overseas. Uh, but that is work that the OECD is taking forward um, and I look forward to its conclusions uh, and I look forward to making sure that we can take forward any recommendations that they make. Will there any? Is the First Minister seriously expecting us to believe that of all the months of the year that the OECD could have picked, they just happened to insist on the one immediately following the election. The Scottish Government has the report already, so the First Minister should publish it now. The independence of this report is in question because of the interference. The Scottish Government and its agencies have timetabled months to alter the report. There's a special group established to make changes, but that's dominated by the SQA and Education Scotland, the very same bodies that are under the microscope of the OECD report. And we all know this because it is in the government's documents that we secured under freedom of information. So how can anyone have confidence in the independence of this report? if the government has the opportunity to meddle with it for months on end. First Minister. Um, I, I, I'm not entirely sure what Will, I think I am sure what Will Rennie is suggesting here, but the idea that the OECD would allow to happen what he has just suggested is happening is completely outrageous, actually. The OECD is a respected organisation. It is carrying out this review for the Scottish Government independently. It has set 
its timetable. Uh, the preliminary report that the Scottish Government has received is purely for accuracy checking. It is not an opportunity to influence the content or rewrite any part of the report. And I don't think the OECD would wear that, even if the Scottish Government was to attempt it, which it is not doing. As I understand it, uh, draft findings will be shared with stakeholders, uh, providing an opportunity for key partners to inform the final report. And the independent report will be published when the OEC decides that it should uh, be published. And if the Scottish Government was trying to dictate either the way in which the OEC did this or the timetable to which they did it, I'm pretty sure Willie Rennie would be standing up here right now saying how outrageous and unacceptable that was. So we will do this properly. And I trust uh, and have confidence, uh, given uh, how uh, well thought of a, an organisation it is, the OECD, to do this and to do it extremely well. Thank you very much. I'm just conscious that we've taken 35, more than 35 minutes to get through the leaders' questions. So I just appeal to members and the First Minister to uh, make their questions and answers succinct. Question number five, Sandra White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle child poverty. First Minister. Well, Monday, of course, marked the important milestone of the introduction of the new uh, Scottish Child Payment, which is a, a key plank in our action to tackle child poverty and indeed a key action in the Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan. Uh, last year, we spent nearly £2 billion on supporting low-income households, uh, with £672 million uh, focused on support for families with children. Um, and uh, next year, we will uh, almost double our investment in the Tackling Child Poverty Fund. In response to the economic impact of the pandemic, we have invested an additional £51 million to continue the provision of free school meals during school closures and holiday periods and our £100 COVID winter hardship payment supported over 144,000 children and young people and of course we have just confirmed a second round of that payment to be paid in the spring. Sandra White. I thank the First Minister for that reply and very good news about the Scottish Child Payment which actually has been hailed by Joseph Roundtree Foundation as more needed than ever. And yet the Tories in Westminster won't commit to maintaining the £20 uplift in universal credit. Does the First Minister agree that if the UK government is serious about tackling child poverty, they should introduce a similar benefit to Scotland's and not cut benefits at a time when many families are really struggling to survive? Uh, yes, I do agree with that, although I don't think there is a shred of evidence that this UK government is at all serious about tackling child poverty. Um, if we look at the £20 uplift, uh, Joseph Rowntree Foundation analysis shows uh, that even with that, an average family with children is £2,900 worse off each year than they were a decade ago. And if that increase is removed, that rises to £3,800 a year. That's the impact on child poverty of the decisions the UK government has taken. Uh, their own analysis highlights that the number of households impacted by the benefit cap nearly doubled last year, uh, with 6,400 households in Scotland losing an average of £50 a week. 97% of those families have children. Uh, so I do think it is time that the UK government stopped hiding its head in the sand uh, about the damage that their policies are causing. A first step, although it would only be a small step, would be to make permanent the £20 increase and extend it to legacy benefits and, of course, also to abolish the benefit cap, the two-child limit and the abhorrent rape clause. Um, and if they wanted to get truly serious about tackling child poverty, they would follow the lead of the Scottish Government um, and establish the equivalent of the Scottish child payment so that we can tackle head-on child poverty and lift more children out of poverty for good. Question six, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. To ask the First Minister what additional and urgent measures will be taken to ensure that pupils catch up and learning lost as a result of the disruption to their education. First Minister. We've prioritised children receiving in-person learning uh, throughout the pandemic, which is, of course, why we confirmed yesterday that children in P1 to P3 and some senior phase pupils will return to school next week, as well as children 
in early year settings. Uh, to support that, we're investing a further £100 million in education recovery and additional family support, uh, as announced yesterday, and that is in addition to existing investments such as uh, the £127 million in pupil equity funding to support those from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, and for older pupils, of course, uh, we were able to provide clarity yesterday that uh, National 5 higher and advanced higher exams in 2021 will be replaced by an alternative certification model based on teachers' judgment of evidence of individual pupil attainment. Jamie Green. Uh, it may be true that some children are returning to school next week, but 11 months of disruption to classroom education is going to come at a great price. Let's not fool ourselves. But First Minister, it's what we do now which will make the difference. The First Minister has repeatedly told us that she will consider proposals or ideas wherever they come from. But beyond warm words, very little action has followed. Starting off, so we put forward sensible proposals for an urgent national tutoring scheme, pulling in resource from anywhere we can to help these pupils catch up. Clear and immediate benefits. Let me simply ask the First Minister, will she now take this forward and discuss these proposals in great detail with me? And if not, why not? First Minister. I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will be delighted to discuss uh, that proposal and any other proposals uh, directly with the member. There is tutoring uh, provision available. I've set this out before through the eSchool platform and of course we will continue to look at how we extend and expand that. Uh, it's not the case that we're not taking action now. That's why as recently as yesterday uh, we confirmed uh, even more investment uh, to help local authorities and schools uh, help pupils catch up on their education. Uh, we have previously in the pandemic uh, made available resources that have allowed an additional 1,400 uh, teachers to be recruited and the investment that was announced uh, a few weeks ago by the Deputy First Minister will allow, if local authorities think that is the appropriate use of that funding, even more uh, new teachers to be recruited. So we will continue to focus on how we support children to catch up on education. But I think there's a, a wider and uh, a bigger imperative and responsibility here, which is to consider holistically how, as we come out of this pandemic, we help repair the overall damage damage that's been done to children's wellbeing. That will partly be about education, but there will be bigger things for us to consider there as well. And this is something that will require our focus for some considerable time to come. Thank you. Question seven, Sarah Boyack. Thank you. To ask the First Minister how the consequentials from the recently announced three and a half billion of funding to replace unsafe cladding in England will be allocated and whether buildings under 18 metres will be included in any grant scheme. First Minister. Uh, so on the question of the consequentials, first of all, we're still waiting uh, on the details of those uh, and also detail of what the new levy and tax on developers will comprise. Uh, two recent consultations on guidance, uh, one from the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyor, Surveyors and another from uh, the Scottish Government, have shown that it is not only those buildings of height 18 metres and above that need to be considered. So our view is that uh, what needs considered is the scale of risk as a whole, rather than only assessing risk on the basis of the height of a building someone lives in. That undoubtedly makes the task more complex in scale, availability of information and also ensuring that public money is used to the greatest effect. However, the Housing Minister will set out a sustainable path forward next uh, month uh, when we hope by that time we will also know the detail of the consequentials so can set out more detail of how these will be used as well. Sarah Black. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer and say the Scottish Government has already had £97 million of consequentials to address the cladding issue, so we need urgency in this. Grenfell was in 2017. I have a constituent as an EWS1 form, which cost £3,000, who still can't sell their home and move on. Our constituents are under immense pressure because they are not able to make their buildings safe, they are trapped in unsaleable homes, and they have not had any support they need that support urgently. So will the First Minister make sure that we get progress on this urgently? There's already £97 million in the budget. That could be spent. There, we know where a lot of these buildings are. There's now been progress on the high-rise inventory. We just need action. Our constituents are trapped and the immense financial and mental pressures they're under need to be addressed urgently. First Minister. Um, I actually agree with uh, much, if not all, of uh, what Sarah Boyack has said there. I, I have constituents in this position as well, so I know the, the stress and the anxiety that this is causing. It is important that we get 
this right. It's, it's important that we have done the work uh, to establish exactly uh, the scale of the problem, the nature of the buildings uh, that will, uh, the owners of which will require help, so that when we are dispersing taxpayers' money to help, we are doing that in a way that will help the maximum number of people. That's why the work that has been done is so important. Uh, there is an urgency. I absolutely accept that, which is why, as I said in my initial answer, the Housing Minister will set out the pathway forward uh, next month when we will be able to give greater clarity and certainty to owners in this position, but based on that foundation of proper consideration consideration and research that I have spoken about. Thank you. We'll take some supplementaries. June McAlpine to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you very much. Following the publication of mortality data for people who have a learning disability in Scotland, the cross-party group on learning disability, along with Enable, have asked the government to ensure that every person with a learning disability in Scotland is supported to come forward for the vaccination, including younger adults in care home settings who are at particular risk. The First Minister will perhaps have read the moving story from author Ian Rankin, whose disabled son Kit is still waiting for the vaccine. NHS England have just issued guidance to GPs recommending that they identify, invite and support all people who have a learning disability to come forward. Will the Scottish Government also be doing that? First Minister. Uh we will be considering uh, whether we need to take further action, but it is important to point out right now that there are as the member knows, there are a range of people with learning disabilities who have uh, been clinically judged already as being clinically extremely vulnerable and therefore will have been vaccinated within cohort four, which was one of the groups uh, that we had the target date of early this uh, week to meet. Um, and indeed, and I think we will publish the first uh, date on this uh, later today or certainly later this week. Uh, around 140,000 uh, people classed as clinically extremely vulnerable have been vaccinated. That is an uptake of around 80 per cent. Uh, the original estimate of that in our deployment plan was around 110,000, so we have exceeded uh, that already. There are some, though, that uh, will not have been vaccinated as part of that cohort and who have profound learning disabilities as well as unpaid carers. Uh, as things stand right now, they will be offered vaccination as part of cohort six, and the invitations for appointments for people within cohort six should start to issue from next week. So people in that group will start to get the certainty of when their vaccination will be delivered. Thank you, Brian Whittle, to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government have plans to utilise the Q COVID risk prediction model developed by the University of Oxford to expand the criteria for those placed on the shielding list? First Minister. Um, we are considering uh, the Q COVID uh, list further. Uh, so the findings of the QCOVID tool have already led to some groups being added to the shielding list in Scotland. Uh, for example, people with chronic kidney disease, uh, stage 5, Down syndrome or severe liver disease. Uh, however, the model was developed using deaths and hospitalisation data from England. So the advice that the government has had is that more work needs to be done on it to validate the tool more fully in relation to Scottish data before we can be more confident about using it more widely in Scotland. So options around that are being considered uh, at the moment and we're considering continuing to work with partners to understand how it can work in the context of Scottish health uh, data. But as I said in the previous answer, the vast majority of those who would have been identified through QCOVID are likely to already be included in either uh, Group 4 or 6 of the GCVI priority list. Thank you. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Emma Harper. Last Sunday, um, the Scottish Government had received only 77,000 applications for the Scottish Child Payment. So that means that even if all the applications are approved, that means that only 44.5 per cent of the 173,000 children, which are estimated by the Scottish Fiscal Commission to be eligible. First Minister will know that the deadline was two days ago on the 15th of February. That means almost 100,000 parents of children that probably need this payment for some reason haven't applied. I wonder if the First Minister, given her commitment that she already reiterated today on child poverty, would consider if this deadline can be extended to ensure that the take-up was much higher than this? And would she agree that in the long run, it does make the case that we need to automate payments such as this, complicated though it is, to ensure that families who need this payment, families who will be living in poverty, can get access to it. First Minister. 
Um, I, I agree with the points on automation. It uh, is certainly the case that we want to automate more um, of uh, the systems uh, through Social Security Scotland, although it is also really important that people have a face-to-face -face option uh, to talk to somebody, because we know that uh, not having that can sometimes be a barrier. We will be continuing to try to encourage maximum uptake. The deadline in terms of having uh, payments uh, backdated uh, was this week, but of course uh, people can uh, apply uh, of new uh, if they decide that they want to do so. I think there's a big job for all of us to do to make sure that people that we represent are aware of these new benefits and know how to apply from them. I uh, took the opportunity uh, in one of the COVID briefings earlier this week, because this is very relevant in the context of the financial challenges of COVID, uh, to share the details of how people could apply, um, and the government will continue to take every opportunity to do that. Thank you. Emma Harper, to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you. Um, First Minister, unsurprisingly, despite calling for it, Labour chose to vote with the Tories against the Scottish Government motion committing to establish a national care service yesterday. Can the First Minister set out what else they voted against last night? First Minister. So the, the, there was some muttering from the Labour benches there. I, I can only take that to mean that they find their, found their decision last night as inexplicable uh, as we did. Uh, the motion last night that, that Labour voted against and actually voted with the Tories against uh, was about scrapping non-residential social care charging, providing unpaid carers with improved recognition and support, improving pay in terms and conditions which reflect fair work principles and national pay bargain, bargaining, and establishing a national care service in law on an equal footing with NHS Scotland. I cannot, uh, for the life of me, work out why Labour... I know why the Tories would have voted against all that. I can't, for the life of me, work out why Labour would. But maybe it starts to explain... Uh, some of the reasons why they are pretty much in the doldrums. Liam Caird, be followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Following the announcement of the extended quarantine regulations, constituents in the oil and gas sector have raised concerns that offshore workers who support projects overseas on a 2-2 rota would have to spend 10 of their 14 days field break alone in a hotel room. Now, of course, they understand the need to minimise the chance of new variants and the need to restrict exemptions, but Given the unique nature of the offshore rota, would the First Minister consider reviewing the list of exemptions to allow these overseas workers to self-isolate at home? First Minister. Uh, we've already said that we will consider any uh, arguments that are made for particular groups. So uh, the short answer, I suppose, is yes, we will consider it. But I want to follow that up immediately with a, a strong caveat. The, the more exemptions we have from the managed isolation policy, the more chance there will be of new variants of this virus coming into the country. So we have to balance all of this uh, and come to the best position overall. As, as we suppress this virus, as we are doing successfully right now, and as we vaccinate more people, as we are doing successfully right now, increasingly the bigger risk that we face will be importation of new variants, variants that might uh, spread more quickly, so be able to beat lockdown restrictions and, more seriously, variants that might undermine the efficacy of the vaccines that we have at our disposal right now. That's why we need to have the utmost caution about borders uh, and about travel. So we will continue to consider fairly any calls for uh, greater flexibility, but we will apply a very rigorous assessment of that because we don't want to undermine any more than is already the case because we don't yet have a Four Nations approach to this, uh, the effectiveness of the policy that we've put in place. Elaine Smith, to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. This is a supplementary to question five. Sandra White, Scottish Labour welcomes the introduction of the initial health payment, albeit later than we'd wanted. And we know this payment will make a difference to many families and help with tackling child poverty. However, given the terrible impact of the pandemic on women's employment in particular, can the First Minister confirm that there is at the moment sufficient capacity to respond rapidly to changes in household circumstances? And can she advise if the data collected on claimants will be disaggregated by sex? Thank you. First Minister. Um, 
I, I'm not entirely sure, uh, and this is my fault, not hers, uh, what Elaine Smith means about sufficient capacity to, to deal with changes in household incomes, but I'm, I'm happy to come back to her with more detail. We are trying to uh, respond rapidly to the circumstances people face uh, with support, including financial support, and we will continue to do that. And uh, we have uh, people across government uh, that are focused on uh, that kind of work. In terms of the data that we will produce from the payment, again, I will check exactly what data, with what frequency and uh, with what degree of disaggregation that will be made available uh, and I'll make sure I write to the member with that information as soon as possible. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, only this morning a Logistics UK survey of its members, most of whom are hauliers or manufacturers, showed that since Brexit almost half, 48.4% had transport operations to deliver goods cancelled or postponed to either the European Union or Northern Ireland. An astonishing 88% of these cited problems with customs. A significant proportion do not expect to return to pre-Brexit operational levels, citing uncertainty and reduced trading confidence, inevitably impacting on jobs and our economy. While solutions lie mostly with the UK Government, how will the Scottish Government assist our key logistics sector at this difficult time? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government uh, and different uh, ministers and officials have been working with logistics companies and with key export sectors to do everything we can uh, to help with the difficulties, the very extreme difficulties they've been facing since the end of the transition period at the start of the year. Uh, I think it's fair to say uh, much of our focus has been on the seafood uh, exporting sector because the damage done to it uh, has been uh, very severe and frankly unforgivable in, in terms of what they have been dealing with. The impact for our exporters and logistics companies uh, have been extreme. Uh, some of them, I hope, will be resolved uh, by action that the UK government takes, uh, but I am not sure that we will see trading patterns uh, return completely to normal because I think those trading pa patterns uh, risk being changed uh, for the long term, and that will mean a loss uh, in financial terms, probably in jobs uh, and overall economic activity to Scotland. And it really does illustrate just how wrong-headed uh, and ideologically driven uh, Brexit was, and it is the Tories that bear the responsibility for it. And Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, serious concerns have been raised regarding the soaring number of patients in Scottish hospitals acquiring COVID-19 while being treated for a non-related illness. Public Health Scotland data has revealed the concerning number of patients affected. What measures will the Scottish Government put in place to ensure increased infection control is undertaken in all our hospitals? First Minister. Uh, there is a... I a significant uh, and very strong focus on infection control in our hospitals. The latest data on uh, nosocomial uh, infection, COVID nosocomial infection, I think uh, will just have been published today. Uh, because of the nature of uh, the collection and analysis of that data, it is, uh, there is a, a three-week time lag on it. I was looking at this morning's uh, data earlier on, uh, and there is a reduction in the, the total number uh, of cases that are deemed to, to be probable or definite hospital onset, although the proportion is still a little bit higher. What we find uh, with COVID and what we have found is that the, the, the trend of hospital-acquired infection mirrors community transmission. So these figures are still from a period when community transmission was much higher than it is right now. And we hope that as community transmission has reduced, so to hospital infection. But every single day, those who work in our hospitals focus very, very hard on trying to minimise the prospect and the possibility of infections being passed, not just COVID, but all infections. And the data uh, that the member refers to uh, is looked at uh, very, very closely so that teams on the ground can know whether there is more they can do. But one of the key lessons uh, for this in the context of COVID is that the relationship between community transmission and hospital transmission is quite a strong one. So the more we can do to reduce community transmission, the more we help reduce it in our hospitals as well. Thank you very much. Apologies to those members we weren't able to reach, but that concludes First Minister's questions. We'll suspend and return at 2.30 with uh, Liberal Democrat business. Parliament is suspended. <laughs>